How are you, Beppe? Hey, how are you? Fine, Bell. Can you hear me? I'm good, me? I'm good. Just you... uh, finally uh, getting back to normal after both the FESPA show and the ITMA show. Yeah, very long, very long no. period of shows. Crazy long. <laughs> you know, it's uh, one of those shows where it's good that it's only once every four years. Yeah, fortunately. Otherwise, we should uh, prepare the day that the year half before to be ready. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I uh, first time I went to an ITMA show was in 1999. It was in Paris, and wow. it was it was ten days long at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fortunately, I went on the last day with David Blake <laughs> and uh, a couple of others. They France, of course, has tr strikes all the time. They had a transit strike during the show. People had to walk five and six miles to get to the show and then five and six miles to get back. On the last day, the strike was over, so we were able to take the train to go there. But yeah. um, just crazy. Who knows? But yeah, anytime absolutely. you go to France, you can expect a, a strike of some kind. Yeah. That's it. Long show, lot of uh, talk, 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 talk. I know. Well, that's what the show is all about. You never know what's going to happen until after it, but during the show, it's just a lot of work and a lot of talking. Yeah, yeah. No, but also, the period after the show has been very busy for us. We got a lot of contact, and uh, we are well, still you, working, you know, replying the customer. No, what very good, positive. You know, when, uh, I mean, you were working out of the MNR booth and out of your own booth, and of course... Yeah, lots of running back and forth for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, was good, was good. And you, are you doing well? You know, I worked with uh, a, a Turkish ink company that I've been working with for quite a few years overseas, and yeah, uh, yeah it was quite busy, uh, yeah. especially the first couple of days, um, up until Saturday, Sunday. Not much of anything. Okay. Uh, and then the rest of the week was okay, but I think the uh, bigger companies all came early. Yeah. To, I know yeah. Uh, they have a lot of accounts in Bangladesh, and uh, all the big companies from Bangladesh were there the first couple of days. Yeah. Which was really nice, and uh, it was good to get them in and out. Yeah. But. Um, you know, between Bangladesh, India, uh, they had quite a few companies and uh, a little bit from Sri Lanka, not that much. China, of course, uh, is always an interesting place. I'm never sure about anything coming out of China, but uh, yeah. And then, oh, you, excellent. Know, I, you know, it's interesting is you just don't see much in the way of American companies coming to the show. I don't yeah. think Amer I don't think Americans know much about ITMA at all. No, it's a it's a different show. It's more for big company, the company vertical company with all the treatment of the textile, everything. Yeah. It was born for that, but because now the company are all vertical, everybody is going to introduce the their own segment. So screen printing is part of these big companies and must be present. Yeah, uh, always interesting. Uh, you know, um, the last FESPA show, I mean, it was show that I did in 19, 2019, the screen printing was terrible. Yeah. Um, very small for screen print, hardly anybody showed up. And really didn't know what to expect. This time it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, a lot I, of uh, a lot of um, uh, machine manufacturer, but also yeah. ink manufacturer. There was a, an interesting proposal. Yeah, and this I think is they, the way to make the show. I think someone said there were twelve different manufacturers of equipment yeah. uh, of automatic equipment at the show, and all of them with. Uh, a digital hybrid uh, installed on the machine. So uh, that was definitely the bulk. Is, 
it's everywhere. It's yeah, everywhere. no, the hybrid was definitely uh, where everything was. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's a bit expensive, but makes sense because uh, provide the digital all the interesting uh, opportunity to respect the standard requested by the brand, etc. And also the adhesion to any kind of uh, uh, substrate that today are not uh, allowed totally with the uh, digital only. So it's a good, it's a good. Uh... Well, it, it was, it was definitely a show that uh, had massive amounts of digital, but uh, and certainly a lot of hybrid machines. Yeah, I think yeah. almost every company that I went to uh, was pretty much showing a hybrid. Yeah. Oh, we were in two uh, different different pavilion where the screen printing was very bad. The exhibition was enlarged to I I don't remember exactly, but to six or seven pavilions. Yeah, it was I, very good, very big. I know. Uh, I mean, there were machines there that I had never seen before. Of course. Uh, we don't get to see Chinese machines much. There's one from Taiwan, quite a few from uh, Turkey, which was kind of surprising uh, seeing some of them. Um, I've seen their ovals, but I haven't seen their hybrids before. Yeah. And uh, that was really quite interesting, I thought. Uh, but you know, when the, when the proposal uh, is uh, large, the plurality of the product and of the idea are always a positive element so very good that everybody is going to launch their own product to be a competition for the uh, most common one and also an opportunity to produce to introduce their home uh, uh, equipment yeah <laughs> I see some new face. I don't know them, but uh, to say okay. Well, to you everybody. guys can introduce yourselves. I mean, you're quite capable. Yeah. Well, hello. It's good to meet you. I'm Bill. I I do Charlie's calls when I can. <laughs> I uh, looking forward to this. I I studied uh, Renaissance uh, materials and technique in Italy uh, oh, for okay. three summers. Okay. Nice. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Nice to meet you, Bill. Good to meet you. Mr. Shaw, go ahead. How are you guys doing today? Good. Uh, we don't know each other, Beppe, but I'm no well aware of you. I've been uh, following you for many years as you came out with inks and so on. And um, right now, uh, I'm a consultant to the industry. I'm doing some work for... Cornet, I'm trying to okay. put together some marketing packages for a couple of people who want to get into wide format. I've been rumbling around the industry for 40 some odd years. Charlie and I have <laughs> uh, trudged through a lot of the same mud together and uh, great. happy to be back involved in textiles. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, it's always fascinating. Absolutely. You, know, you would have loved to have come to the ITMA show besides seeing what uh, uh, the new Cornet $1.8 million machine looks like. Yeah. And uh, I did video some of it. If you wanted, I can shoot you uh, the takeoff part that was uh, totally automated. Yep. Um, but I mean, there was so much in the way of machinery there this time that really was uh, interesting, innovative. Uh, Beppe's uh, white ink on hybrid machines were being used quite a bit. I actually have one of the uh, one of the shirts that uh, M and R was producing. Uh, I don't know how much you can get it. Every shirt was different, but the designs—I I should say—the design stayed the same. The colorways changed from shirt to shirt to shirt, uh, but. Uh, Pepe is white ink. So this, Pepe, why don't you talk about your new white ink? Because it's quite different than the old stuff. 
Yeah, uh, is we try to reduce the number of the screen involved in the hybrid because uh, you know uh, you have usually two white and then uh, a pre digital and then a, a top coat. So this means four screen to print four color in digital. So we thought it was a little bit too much. So what we try to do is to make a, a white, super opaque, really, really opaque in the first position, and the blending white in the second position instead of the pre-digital uh, transparent. Uh, it's a blending white because in practice it's just a clear with 20% uh, of the same white of the first screen. And this allowed us to achieve a perfect white point white and maintain uh, the power of the transparent in receiving the digital. So the solution was good despite the DS had some problem during ITMA because uh, I don't know which kind of problem, but uh, we found difficulty after the top coat to dry to dry the, the 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 ink, but this was another story. But the result was, of course, uh, really appreciate, and we are happy about that. So just two screen, in order to digital, and uh, we also suggest and propose in that occasion, instead to print the top coat a regular top coat, uh, we uh, propose a sparkling. Uh, top coat that was really uh, shining and going to create a special effect on the on the color of the print. So this is what we did in during Hitma in the MNR booth. Anyway, Beppe, do me a favor. Give me a rundown on when you got into the industry and how you got in and. Uh why you got in because uh, i think all of us kind of wonder way, why we all got in but in in this way you can uh, discover my age so <laughs> it's not nice uh yeah i am in the industry since about uh, 47 years uh i uh, met the, the the industry just for a case because my brother was a screen printer uh, I was good making design, so one day he asked me to make some design for him. The design was appreciated, and then he involved me in the company as the graphic designer, etc. This is how we approach. But as usual happened, I never happy about my job, so I continues to develop uh, in terms of uh, color separation because uh, the supplier making color separation for us wasn't satisfying our request to achieve specific uh, result. I've been in the United States without to speak one word to try to understand the way you were uh, approaching the color separation. I mean, uh, simulation process, pot color, etc. And I pass uh, three day only uh, watching, watching, watching the print on the machine uh, until I understood what was the the trick. And so I went home, I tried to start making my color separation and the result was really successful. And uh, so the customer was happy, but also my competitor was looking to have my color separation. So I decided to leave my brother company, who was a printer, and open a color separation company by myself. And so uh, the story start. Along the way, we became a uh, Wilfless distributor for Italy, MNR distributor for Italy, uh, Newman Roller uh, for Italy, uh, UV Inc, Nasdaq UV Inc for Italy, etc. So we make also a lot of experience in uh, supply chain. Uh, we had good result, good successful result in Italy, and the company grow 
uh, dramatically. But uh, during uh, the period uh, that the production was moving to east and then to south, uh, we lost a lot of business because uh, no more production here. Everybody was to send the production overseas or somewhere else. And so my my business uh, in terms of machinery and ink was difficult to do. So what we try to do is to make our own um, uh, ink line. It was 2010, uh, 2007, I think, 2007. And in 2007, Virus Ink was born. It was only uh, water-based ink. This uh, ink uh, had the uh, goal to achieve performance uh, because uh, 2007, you can imagine how the water base was appreciated in comparison with the plastic source. So our objective was to find a water base uh, working similarly than plastic source. So first thing we try to do is to launch a very stable ink water base, able to stay for a couple of hours in the screen without to clog the mesh. And again, uh, after that, uh, the second challenge has been uh, to print wet on wet. And you know, water base wet on wet is not uh, so easy. They mostly have to flash any color. And even though today there are some other manufacturer printing uh, making ink wet on wet, but they are not able to go over three to four color. Instead, we are in condition to go also to eight, 10, as we demonstrate several times during our wow event and uh, also many shows. We have been the first uh, provoking the market, printing water based during the show, because uh, you know, Printing in the show is the best condition for the water base, yeah. but we did it. And uh, after three years, also the other manufacturer has been obligated to do the same. So we we stimulate them to lift the bar, and this is always a benefit for the for the market. Uh, this is what we try to do. Mm. Our success in the United States was uh, fantastic. In the first three year, we get a lot of business. We close agreement with uh, three of the biggest uh, distributor, American distributor, and other four smaller. But event uh, create the, the the situation that we had to leave United States because. Uh, Many, many other things. This is a sad story. We don't want to, to tell anybody. But uh, we lost the opportunity because in 10 years, we changed uh, the approach to the water base. And today, the water base is also printable in single stroke. You have seen that uh, during ITMA, we launched a Debo Squeegee, not a Debo Squeegee as all of us uh, used to know because what is in the market the first squeegee is going to move all the ink and the second one is printing nothing is not some particles so uh, our uh, the squeegee is a pattern system not only with the method but also for the treatment the regulation and the treatment uh, in teflon to make the cleaning very easy and uh, fast. Uh, through the first squeegee, there are openings allowing the ink to go over, and the second squeegee is going to print the second pass. So today, not only a stable ink, not only a wet on wet printing, but also a single stroke for water base. So, this make the possibility for the water-based printing, especially the one making uh, production, the production, to improve 65% their productivity. And as you could see, the print uh, work for seven days 
in the MNR booth on the digital uh, hybrid application. That's all. Uh, today we are still here. We have some other idea on the way because we think there is uh, not only to work on the squeegee, but also in another couple of parts of the printhead. And this is something we are researching and uh, covering with the patent protection. But you know, we are a familiar company, very small, and we have to make investment one to one, otherwise we finish the money. And this is what we are doing. A long story as you, as you see, but uh, uh, the other side is about 47 years I here to do something different than the day before. So uh, with your new double squeegee, are you you're manufacturing that yourself? Yes, we do by ourselves. We create matrix uh, treatment. We uh, per, uh, to ITMA we launch for two machine rock and uh, MNR uh, for um, a matter of time, but we are already producing prototype for uh, MHM and another couple of uh, machine. So we are in contact because all the manu uh, machine manufacturer in the show has been contacted by us requesting the design of the squeegee in order to produce for them. But uh, this is just the beginning of the story because uh, the squeegee is not an issue also in textile, only in textile, but also for glass application where the business is larger, but also for warnings. For example, Sakurai machine needs to straw, And the Sakurai machine produce 2,000, 2,400 pieces per hour. Try to imagine if you are able to print a single instead of double, which kind of speed they are going to achieve. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, project that we are developing. Are you going to, you don't have any, well, let me rephrase. Do you have any distributors in the U.S. for your ink or for any of the other uh, products anymore? Not yet, because in my opinion, it's not necessary. Because to ship 10 squeegee or 20 squeegee uh, is quite easy. It's not costly and can go direct to the customer. This is going to offer better uh, price to the customer, that is what we mean. Having a dealer, as we had in the past for the ink, there is just an addition of charge and uh, sometimes is too much in according. But we have requests. For example, uh, it's quite strange. Our competitor, uh, Matsui, asked us to distribute our squeegee in uh, makes sense because they have a water-based market but yeah. we need to we need to think about because uh, you know our market is very delicate in terms of uh, psychological uh, balance uh, everybody thinks differently and if you make something wrong you are not in the condition to be successful but we have it In the big area like Bangladesh, India, we had a lot of interest. Yeah. Also I, uh, I mean, having been to Bangladesh and going to a lot of the major companies there, I can certainly see where uh, they would have great interest in your squeegee, but also in your ink. Uh, they produce a lot. They make it very difficult to produce quickly. You know, yeah two, three screen, uh, white screens with two to three strokes per screen is fairly uh, common. Uh, uh, they have several problems because I've been there visiting the most important client over there. Uh, their pro standard production is 150 PC per hour and yeah. they buy machine able to print 900. Uh, it's a nonsense. But just adjusting something, we put them in the condition in one day to move from 180 
to 500. Uh, this uh, with the demo stroke. Try to imagine if you consider to install also the squeegee because there the problem are not uh, the, uh, the technology, but the product they use. Because uh, as mm -hmm. often happen in that area, they invest millions of dollars in machinery, very performant machinery, and they kill the performance of the machinery just because they buy cheap product. And they yeah. stop the screen, they clean the screen, and the flash instead to flash in two seconds, they flash in four, five seconds. They do not understand that uh, one second uh, versus, uh, uh, sorry, two second versus three means already 30% uh, more productivity. So they complain about the marginality they have because in Bangladesh they, re they work with very low margin. Yeah. So it's one more reason to produce faster. Uh, but this is look, looks like to be a difficult step to understand. You know what I found when I was there um, working with companies, and I did uh, show them a couple of things, diff different uh, double squeegee than what you have, and how we could reduce from three screens down to two, from um, three strokes down to two strokes. The problem that you have there is unless you speak to the owner of the company, nobody changes anything. And the reason they don't, <clears throat> even though you can show them how they can increase their production by 25, 30%, they don't want to do it because then they're afraid that the owner of the company will ask them why they didn't do it sooner. And so since they uh, are quite happy, the owner is quite happy with what they get. Uh, nobody, the production managers or the uh, plant managers, even if you show them how you can make it faster, they don't want to do it. The only way to get it done is to speak to the owners. And unfortunately, with Bangladesh, a lot of the owners live in England and are not even in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a problem, but uh, you touch a very interesting point. Because uh, I've been visiting Masco, you probably know this company in Bangladesh. And there are two big uh, buildings. One yeah, is that, full of MNR, another one is full of rock. Correct. And so try to imagine which kind of production. And this is a company where we improve the productivity to 500, just retouching something. And it's also changing mesh count, et cetera, because uh, they were using uh, not good thing, so was obligate to use larger mesh count and uh, it was in conflict with the speed of the production. But the big problem has been, right, the production manager. Yep. Is the production manager blocking every evolution? Why? Because otherwise is going to show the limit he had in the past year. And the owner is going to tell him uh, what you did in the past year. In one day, we get a different productivity. Why right. that? So they are killing any communication from you or consultant in general to the ownership. And this is the big problem because they are killing their market. Because today, Bangladesh is very working with a very, very, very little margin. So they are. This lost uh, you. Uh, there other. you go. So, uh, but this, this is the situation in uh, in the market. Uh, I've, been, I've been to that company and I did work with them. Yeah. And did it, did it go anywhere? No. Yeah. Uh, just because you're not dealing with the owner, unless you talk to the owner, it won't change. They came back to visit us during ITMA. Uh, the production manager has been there. Oh, you have to help me. But I already help you, but you won't, don't want. Uh, the what we can do different? Yeah. The squeegee you know, is an, an, is, is an uh, further uh, uh, benefit for you, but if you are not open for change, you never change. Well... And you're right. Uh, you know, that is a problem. Are they really open for change? Not much. 
if they're making money, even if it's a little, um, they're content to leave it alone. Yeah. Which, anyway, you know, I think just to talk about an argument interesting for everybody, we are not many, so we can run around. Concerned in the printing in the future, I think there is two directions. Be right back, guys. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I think we lost Glenn for a moment. I mean, he's... Uh... Yes, I can okay. hear you. Yeah, okay, he, no. he, he just has the sound off. Uh, must be doing my... something really important. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, it could be. Uh, we can justify him. Uh, now, what I want to add to this quick discussion is that uh, the direction of the screen printing uh, could be in the future very exciting, but need massive change. Massive change means mentality, uh, 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 mentality in approaching the screen printing, digitalization that is not necessary a digital machine, but it, the digitalization of the uh, machine functions that can go to uh, provide automatic uh, regulation in according with some specific term. Uh, otherwise, the discussion will be always on the price, 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 price. And who yeah. makes money by big machine? We are convincing the industry that the big machine is a sense of uh, a, a live screen printing, but no, it's just a, a, a method to try to be more competitive. But uh, if we don't change the kind of approach and uh, discovering which is the weak point will be always difficult to be successful in the future because digital is becoming stronger, but also more expensive. Uh, yeah, by a lot. Uh, Polaris, Polaris. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Cornix, uh, 1.8 million. Uh, Polaris, uh, 1 million. Uh, digital oh, hybrid uh, from MNR machine and uh, digital is about 384,000, uh, 400,000. And the yeah. screen print machine still inside within the uh, um, $100,000. So there is still potential to grow uh, because digital is not suitable for everything as today screen printing is not suitable for everything. There is a lot, a lot of business for the digital, but same for the screen printing. But of course, we have to lift the bar of the quality, because if you go to investigate about the, about the data and of comparison between screen printing and digital, digital is taking the lowest quality part of the screen printing. So where the screen printing is not able to provide solution of result. So he, there, the digital jump in, because very easy, you push the button, you get the print. But for the rest of the production, screen printing uh, still has something to say. Yeah, you know, I just don't see screen printing going away. I think certainly more hybrid situations are going to develop. Um, without a doubt, not everyone is going to be able to jump on it just because the cost is extraordinary for a lot of smaller companies. Um, you know, with other things, you know, the other factors that are coming into play, I mean, you have uh, DTF, which was a mm. lot of talk uh, at FESPA and at ITMA, um, which, of course, doesn't, it replaces some of what uh, the hybrid would do. It replaces some of what screen print would do, um, short runs, full color, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's a lot of technology that's actually hitting the market all at once right now. And I think a lot of it comes down to uh, 
um, looking at where you where your particular company is and what will benefit it most in terms of growth and and staying competitive. Well, know, the, uh, the, the, the big mistake we can do is to be convinced that one technology will be able to replace another one. This never happened and never will happen. Uh, why? Because both of the technology need each other for some application, etc. And there are some applications specific 100% for the digital, as there are specific applications for screen printing. So uh, it's stupid to also the DTF. DTF is horrible, but if you go to think the it's horrible as an end field, etc. No, you know, in the fashion is not acceptable, etc. But if you go to think carefully to this technology, it's going to solve a lot of problem to the small shop doing small quantity or uh, so I don't know, an organization or uh, the fest or what else. This is fantastic. So no one technology is wrong. As many they are on the market is good. And in my opinion, a big company should have one of each inside because it depends on the kind of job you have, you have a solution. This is the power of the printing in the garment decoration. We spend time to fight. My technology is better than your. Digital is the future. Screen printing is already done, etc. It's wrong. It's wrong because it's a no sense because all of us knows that uh, there are production for one and production for other one. And also the investment, you no, know, a Polaris or, or a, 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 a Cornet, 1 million, 1.8 million. So how many company can buy? Ah, there are some also two or three, but how many others? Yeah. So, you know, Pepe, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, being in both parts of the industry, textile and non-textile and graphic, and I've seen this evolution in graphic, you know, from both uh, cut sheet, screen print, digital, continuous feed. You know, we are apparel decorators. Exactly. So, you know, how we decorate that is up to the guy who's really looking at the business and saying, I can decorate this apparel this way at the best result to my company and the customer, and I can do it this way. And the options just keep growing. So when I hear you say something like, you know, they should have one of everything, you know, it it's so... It's so true to elevate the conversation to say we're not not that we're screen printers, not that we're digital printers, we're apparel decorators. Right. So yeah. How do Absolute. we do that best? Absolutely. I would include also the embroidery, because also the embroidery, you know, one day the digital is going to replace the embroidery. No, but the digitalization of the machine can help to get a better embroidery. So we have to cooperate all together. I'm 100% screen printing because it's my passion. It's something I spend a life to try to understand, but this is my field of action. So uh, other one mm, will be in the digital, but try to put together all this knowledge and uh, vision for the future, how much faster we could grow. I agree. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, certainly the bigger companies, um, even when I went to Bangladesh, it was not unusual to see screen print uh, on automatic, screen print on tables, uh, digital, uh, straight digital, digital hybrid. Uh, all the major companies have gone in that direction. And uh, basically, they are able to handle whatever is put in front of them in terms of uh, the most efficient way to get a particular job out the door. And um, what's interesting when you when you go to a place like Bangladesh, the big companies are monstrous. Um, 
when you come to the U.S., which is kind of funny because every foreign com company wants to have representation in the U.S. In the U.S., we don't, you know, even when you look at the biggest of the companies that we have, uh, they're not as diversified. Uh, they are screen printers. They may have digital equipment as well. None of them are monster companies because none of that business is really in the U.S. anymore. And so the idea of having one of everything is a great idea, but I don't. I think it's an idea that's going to be um, more in use overseas than it is in America. Yeah, America. You know what I think is a bit too bit too much conservative, not because the people, but because the the people controlling the market. They are keeping the customer. A uh, block to specific way to think, and what I can see is that everybody is doing the same thing. And when you do the same thing of the other, you can be different also with the price. And this is yeah. a no sense. Instead, to go to see the people also in Bangladesh, you mentioned that, but in India, in many area, I travel everywhere, and I can confirm that. Uh, People are looking to buy fantastic machine and cheap product. So the people need to understand that their business is not to buy consumable, but their business is to produce print. So which technology is suitable to produce this kind of decoration? This is going to address the people to buy the right machine, digital or screen printing. It depends on the number, it depends on the variation, it depends on the productivity, it depends on uh, uh, the cost, it depends on many things. But if you have no clear idea about that, it will be very difficult to change the mentality. And this is what I found in the United States. I spent there over 10 years for nothing, but I did it. And I could understand some situation. And the market is controlled by the lobbies deciding what to do, what to sell, and how to sell. And this is the reality you have to admit, because without to admit the problem, you never think to a solution. Yeah, I, you know, I think the more you travel, the more you realize how conservative Americans really are and how... Uh, difficult it is to stand out in America. Um, we just don't get the uh, big jobs anymore. We used to. Of course, there was a time where nobody was going overseas. Now everybody uh, doesn't hesitate to go overseas. I can remember when I first started, even trying to sell a t-shirt that was made overseas was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted it to be American made. Um, only because they thought that the overseas quality wasn't going to be as good. And um, that really wasn't the case. But nevertheless, that, that was the mindset at that time. Nowadays, um, it's rare to see anything that's made in the U.S. in the way of garments. You know, there's a handful of companies that produce some, but most of it is done anywhere but the U.S. Um, price points in the U.S. are difficult. Uh, just because labor is quite high versus uh, some of the other countries that uh, are getting the bulk of the work. And uh, I don't know, the U.S. market is just kind of an interesting one. I think the U.S. market personally is made up of small and middle-sized shops. I don't think we really have what you would call a major-sized shop anymore. You know, the, the company Moscow in uh, Bangladesh has two buildings with probably, um, I don't know, each building was about seven or eight floors. Um, exactly. I know I was up on the roof of one of them where the CEO has his uh, homing pigeons and his little retreat. But in talking to the production manager, I said, how many shirts, how many prints a day do you do? And even if he was exaggerating a bit, they do about 350,000 prints a day. You know, I mean, it's a staggering number, especially when you think about American companies. And I don't know who the biggest in the U.S. is, but 
no one in America comes even remotely close to that kind of number. And even if they were not truthful about it, it was only 300,000. That's a daily situation for them. Yeah, you know, but when but, they need to improve, when they need to improve the productivity, they buy other 10 machine. When I they know. go to buy the machine in the show, they buy 10 by 10. No, not I, one, two, 10 by 10. Okay, I, I, and that's it. And that's no, I agree. It, well, that's how you improve the right way. You, you buy more, buying more machines really doesn't improve productivity. It improves about the uh, output, but not your productivity. The productivity yeah. per machine still stays the same. If they not ever, you know, yeah. if they ever really spent time, uh, and uh, if you ever get to speak to the owners of the, of the companies. They don't need more machines. They just need to be more efficient on the machines Absolutely. they have. They certainly Absolutely. have tons of machines. And they they go to buy an enormous machine because they have to flash any single color. And what about the cost of the energy? So yeah. who is making this question? So they found the easiest solution, but without to consider. I've been visiting in... in, in uh, uh, I don't remember the name. Uh, the company where was used to work our friend Mark Gervais. They have 50 or 70 machines and seven, seven kilometers of table printing. Seven kilometers. Oh, you're and talking about hey, Mark, uh, in China. Hey, Mark, the people live in the morning. Night is not home yet. Seven kilometers on Eight floor, up and yeah. down. So they add people. They add people at table, and they improve the productivity. So yeah. perhaps there is something to review in the screen printing because I can accept that in the emerging country this is something can happen, but now they are no longer emerging country because they are leader in the market in the garment decoration. So they have experience, technology, and everything. They have to move forward. And Ningbo is the name of the, is the company Ningbo, in China. Ningbo, yeah, correct. And and actually, they built a second facility in Vietnam that's equal I in know. size to the one in China, uh, because China was getting too expensive in terms of labor. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. Uh, for they are they are also looking in, in other direction again because I have good contact because we provide them some container of ink to print uh, for Nike. Uh, organic ink because uh, now we also have a, a line with organic ink. Uh, we replace um, chemical from carbon to chemical from plant origin. So it's been approved uh, in terms of uh, coloration, productivity, durability by Nike and Adidas, and they are producing for them a big uh, bulk order. Yeah, but seven kilometer. I've been impressed. Seven kilometer. Well, yeah. You have, to, you need a bike. You need a bike to go to control. No, you need you need a golf cart, not a bike. Yeah, a bike you yeah, actually have to pedal. Where the golf cart, you can just go. But um, I'm sure they have scooters to get around. But that's all. I don't now, want it, to take you talk too much time because uh, when I'm involved in screen printing discussion, I never stop. Uh, so, uh, well, it's tell me when when I need when I have to stop and I shut down. Yeah, I never had a chance to go to Ningbo uh, when Mark Gervais was there. Kept asking me if I wanted to come uh, come over, but every time I went to China, I was tied up with shows and. Uh, Never really had the opportunity, but maybe one day, although he's not there anymore. Yeah. It's an impressive company. Uh, it's a city uh, you yeah. go into yeah. and you have everything inside. Yeah, also, I... the style office of the brand is inside there. Yeah, uh, I understand. It's just a, in, in a very immense situation. I don't know how many... I think they said automatics. They have some something like two hundred of them. Yeah, not not all. In uh, in uh, in Nimbo, they have fifty or seventy. I don't remember exactly because they 
to chase other machine. But if you go to consider also Vietnam and another plant again, because uh, we deliver the ink in different right. address, uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I think I, I... one of the last order of machine they did to rock was about 70, the last yeah. order. Yeah, I mean, in, in crazy numbers. Because I know uh, when yeah. they, when I was friendly with when Florian, uh, was with MHM, he met with Mark and uh, they bought 20, uh, 20 automatics at that time. And uh, that was a fairly common situation for them. They never bought one or two machines. They, whatever they bought, they bought a bunch of them at once. <laughs> yeah. And in this case, you made the price. Yeah. In this case, is, you made the price. Now you go there, m and I want 70 machine, which is your best price. Yeah. Well, uh, it, MHM is going to do that. Rock is going to do that. And then everybody down. Oh, they have so they some of everybody's every machine. Time. Yeah. They own some of everybody's. It's interesting. Since they're a Chinese company and they're buying machines from any place other than China. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that means that they're not in love with the Chinese machines or something, whatever. Well, who knows? So where do you think the next big market is going to be? I was talking to some people um, and they're still thinking that Ethiopia may still become uh, another hotbed for textiles. Yeah. It started out, it started to get there and then the pandemic hit and kind of killed off a lot of what was going on in uh, Ethiopia. And I'm just wondering if uh, they may actually start doing things in Ethiopia again. Could be an interesting- uh, I, could, I could no longer hear you very well. I'm uh, losing here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, no. Okay, yes. so uh, my thought was that uh, Ethiopia was actually becoming uh, a major player on textiles where they were actually moving into some really, really big factories that were taking over an entire town. And then the pandemic hit and everybody kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, what your thoughts are, if you think uh, Ethiopia is going to be the next one of the next big markets. Uh, this is a a curious a curious consideration. In my opinion, in my opinion, there is uh, today a lot of consideration for on Africa, Africa, yeah. but uh, I don't consider Africa yet ready uh, because infrastructure are needed to make something uh, effective. Uh, there is a, a, a part of the south of the Russia, there is Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, that area looks like to became. Now there is a little bit of confusion because the war, Russia and Ukraine, but yeah. this belt of the lower part of the Tan country looks like to be a very interesting. Uh, part to produce in terms of uh, and also because they have a very good uh, connection, they have infrastructure, proper infrastructure etc and still uh, population uh, who need to, to work so this is a good warranty for price cost, the labor cost Tajikistan, yeah. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, because despite everything, they are very connected with Russia. Yeah, but right now that's they not a good thing. And so they are going to benefit in about all the service without to be Russian. And this is, in my opinion, a belt of, of, uh, how Eurasia interesting to consider. Yeah, I'm not, you know, uh, because of the whole issues with Russia right now, I'm not sure if any of those kind of countries are going to be that favorable until until this whole 
conflict is resolved. And and I agree with you. Africa, you know, I read a, an article that 10 poorest countries in the world are all from Africa, uh, yeah. where the uh, income average is ridiculously low, which is why it would become potentially a, a uh, perfect situation to build factories. Uh, unfortunately, also, you have uh, extremely unstable government and, and infrastructure. And that's the part that's not really only there scary. is also a lot of there is also a lot of corruption. Oh, so, huge. Uh, political instability. So very difficult, very difficult to make plan. Yeah. I know people from Mauritius that invest a lot of money in Madagascar, over uh, 20 billion, and they was being obligated to leave there everything and to run away before things go worse. Yeah. So, uh, it's, not, it's not is, yet. It's not yet. It's good for the one going to take uh, uh, materials, etc. but production, they are not ready yet for production or something. The corruption is pretty dramatic. I mean, I was even going through the airport, um, they wanted money for me to move on to the next plane. It's well, like, okay. really? I, you know, yeah. and, and it was blatant. It was by, by the officials. And it was like, really? Uh, yeah. You know, it's one thing to, to uh, hit somebody for some money. You don't expect the officials who are actually passing where you're passing through to be part of that blatant situation, but that's Africa for you. Yeah, that's our area where to have a fast track and easy connection. You put ten dollar into the passport, and you are the president of everything. Yeah, and I mean, they go to they, they uh, ten dollar. Ten dollar solve any problem. Yeah. Actually, to be honest with you, I think I only had three dollars, and that was enough to get me through as well. So yeah, because for uh, you it's nothing. You know, they are a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, it, it, exactly. That's the unfortunate thing is even three dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I that, don't know it if was, they take three dollar in a day. You know, amazing, yeah. but I don't know. Um, I think the whole thing with until Russia uh, and Ukraine. Uh, that situation is resolved. It's going to be difficult to work with any of the other countries that are surrounding it between uh, Belarus and all the other ex-Russian uh, countries, you know, or parts of Russia that broke away. Uh, certainly the the ability there is, is there. I, when I was in Russia, what kind of uh, caught me by surprise, Moscow was very thriving and, and uh, people were very upscale, Etc. St. Petersburg was like a third world country. Yeah. Um, you know, I was amazed as to how sad the people were and and uh, how poor they were. And I kind of gauged it. Uh, the hotel that we stayed in uh, was a little out of Moscow, uh, a little out of downtown. And we wanted to go to Catherine's Palace. Catherine's Palace, from where I was, uh, was about an hour and five minute ride. And so we're talking to the concierge. He said, you know, we want to take a uh, the train and then the bus. And they said, well, why don't you just take Uber? And I said, really, you have Uber here? <laughs> OK. So we took Uber. <laughs> an hour and five minutes on a regular Uber was $11. And it was like, really? $11? Uh, we took an, a black Uber to get back to the boat. So they have a deal. If, you st if you're in Finland, which is where we were, if you take the overnight uh, boat to St. Petersburg on tour, so the overnight boat has to be from 1960. I mean, it must have been the love boat from TV. But in any event... Uh, by doing that, you're allowed to be in Russia for 72 hours without a visa. Uh, when I went to Moscow the first time to get my visa, it was probably 25 pages of filling out forms. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this one was 
uh, 72 hours, uh, no visa. Great. Uh, so this, uh, this was because wife... your this is was because your shirts <laughs> too many flour. I'll tell you, the boat was scary, but and, and we had a stateroom. You have no idea what the size of the small rooms were like. To open their suitcase, they had to go into the hallway and open the suitcase in order to bring their clothing in, into the room. But in any event, uh, to get back to the boat, we took an Uber Black. That was about a 35-minute drive, and that was $12. <laughs> so in the U.S., just looking at an Uber Black, you're into about $60 to $70 before you've gone anywhere. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it, it just kind of made it easy to figure out how poor uh, the people in, in Russia really are. That being said, we're going over to uh, the Hermitage and a uh, chrome plated Bugatti drives down the street. Bugatti started about $2 million, okay? And I'm looking at this thinking, obviously it's an oligarch. And, and this particular one was so chrome that you could see the reflections of the buildings on it. And I'm thinking, it's gotta be two and a half, $3 million car. And, you know, if, if I took all the people that were in the Hermitage that day and took all of their salaries and put them all together for the next 10 years, they couldn't, they couldn't, buy a car buy. like that with, yeah, every, yeah. with all their money pulled together absolutely Mos That's moscow is a, is an unbelievable city it's the most expensive city worldwide uh, just consider that you mentioned about the poverty in uh, st petersburg and try to compare with moscow there is another star because there is the power there is the business there is everything there is the mafia so the yeah. money is there. Oh, yeah. That, when I was in hey Moscow, guys, I mean. I got to jump off. Uh, I got a meeting in about two minutes. Yeah, and we're uh, actually going to wrap it, it up. It's a pleasure meeting you, finally. And uh, hopefully we'll catch you around at some of the trade shows. Okay, it will be my pleasure. Thank you for attending. Glenn, I uh, Pepe, Pepe, thank you so much for being on. I think we are probably going to close this down. Um, all of this will be on my website. It's been recorded. So if um, you or anybody wants a copy, I can do it, but it'll be on my website anyway. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. You, very much, uh, you have Charlie. a great evening. I know you're uh, ready for you a glass too. of wine. I say hello also to Bill. Yes. Thank you for yeah. attending. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Well, we'll thank see you at the next show. Thank okay. you again. Ciao. Ciao, Charlie. Take care. All right, ciao.